One of the things that's so difficult to deal with when you're talking about labor relationships is that words get co-opted so that fairness and freedom have distinct libertarian and common law origins and are converted and flipped over when you start to deal with them within the statutory space. So if you're trying to talk about fairness, the traditional definitions of unfair competition always stress the kinds of means that would be used in these sorts of settings. And unfair competition and unfair practices had to do with sharp practices, with fraud, with deception, with the use of coercion in order to muscle rivals out of a marketplace. Uh, the key feature about the standard common law definition of fairness was that it had no built-in end state or patent principle associated with it, so that if you had the appropriate processes and could enforce contracts and keep transactions costs relatively low, whatever distribution took place in the workplace was fine because the processes that generated it were fine as well. When you get to both the Ledbetter situation and particularly with respect to the Paycheck Fairness Act, you have yourself a violently different conception of what counts as fairness. Now the key elements are not the processes that are used in order to generate the outcomes for which there are serious restraints, but instead what we find is that the ultimate test is whether or not the outcomes comport to some prior distributional standard about the way in which things ought to be done. And there is in the United States today a very powerful sense of the way in which these things ought to take place, which is to assume that if you took a randomized population, in this case it's sex discrimination or gender discrimination that's at stake, is that you should see an outcome which essentially is indifferent to the sex of the various individuals occupying various kinds of places. So that the definition of fairness is that if you looked at the curves, you would see median incomes, occupational distributions, and so forth, which pretty much matched one another across sexual lines. And that, of course, is something which has not been true and never will be true, given the fact that there are certain different forces inside and outside the marketplaces that lead to some degree of segmentation. And when one turns to freedom with respect to the um, Employee Free Choice Act, again you see a real inversion about the way in which particular concepts were done. The standard common law definition of associational freedom applies to all persons at all times and says in effect that there is a basic rule in which absent monopoly situation you get to pick the persons with whom you wish to associate and those with whom you do not and it is not an employee right to have freedom. It's a right of all individuals in the employment relationship, whether they be employees on the one hand or employers on the other, so that the appropriate rule would be that no employer could coerce workers to join him if they chose not to do so, and by the same token, no particular worker could demand that an employer negotiate with him if it turns out that the employer did not wish to do so. This particular conception of freedom was, in fact, effectively rebutted in the United States with the passage of the National Labor Relations Act, which substituted a system of what you might want to call sort of democratic politics within the workplace as a substitute for the notion of pure associational freedom, and then imposed a duty, a bargain in good faith upon both the union and the management once it turned out that the union had a majority of workers in a given place. And so here what happens is the notion of freedom becomes much more selective and the basic argument is that workers are now entitled to unionize or night at their free will and pleasure and that the employers have no freedom to reject their particular overtures if they are done collectively but must in fact have a duty to bargain with them. The question that one has to ask in looking about all these situations is when you're talking about conceptions of freedom on the one hand or unfairness of the other, which of them is going to generate the higher level of social welfare, um, which is going to be of great concern to us all. I might add that this question of social welfare is particularly pressing today in virtue of the fact that virtually all of the news that we see coming out of the press indicates that major firms, and I don't only mean law firms, but large corporations in virtually every market sector are downsizing in a very determined and very precipitous fashion so that we are already in an employment recession which is deeper than that in the last recession of 2000, probably is going to be by the time we have run the course as deep as any recession that we have had since the 1930s because there doesn't seem to be anything on the other side which is propping things up. My own view is under these circumstances where you see that the situation has gone very bad with respect to labor, 
the key feature that you want to do is not to give certain protected status to individuals once they've gotten a job, but to try to create an environment in which as many jobs will be created as possible. And for that, I have no question that the traditional common law framework, which is designed to deal with these issues, will outperform the elaborate regulatory frameworks that are A, in place, and B, which are going to be made more draconian and more difficult as we start to go down this path in the new Obama administration. And so let me again sort of repeat what I think to be the basic logic of a common law system of labor relations. And the point here is that when you look to sources of regulation in a common law framework, what you're trying to do is to counteract the dangers of force, the dangers of fraud, and the dangers of monopoly. In looking at labor relationships, one of the happy features about employment context is that none of these difficulties are particularly acute in working the system. So that even though there may be ex post adjustments that you would want in an individual case, there's a relatively weak ground for ex ante controls of the situations at hand. And so, for example, if you are trying to figure out whether or not it's possible to commit fraud within a workplace on a systematic basis, generally speaking, workers have such complete information about the nature of the jobs, whether they've been paid, prospects for promotion, and so forth, that it is possible to do this, but not to do it on a very systematic basis. So that the key in these situations is to therefore reduce the transactions costs needed to form jobs. And the way in which per workers are going to be protected is, in a sense, to have the option to quit because there'll be other options to be hired by some other firm which will offer them a better deal in wages, packages, and so forth. So that you simply rely on a single method, that of choice, in order to try to keep the wage levels high. And there's no question that if you start to look at the way in which wages correlate with productivity, it's almost a lockstep correlation. The deviations are so small in those two graphs that there's nothing else there. To put it in another term, there is no way that you can improve the overall aggregate wage levels of individuals by trying to create a new kind of framework which has certain distributional constraints, but nonetheless does not ensure productivity gains. Or to put it in another passageway, the way in which I conceive of all regulations in the workplace, which go beyond the problems of force and fraud and monopoly, as implicit taxes on the gains from trade that take place from the two sides of the arrangement. And what happens is, if the size of the tax exceeds essentially the potential gain from the arrangement, it will shut down no matter what anybody decrees. So if you want to look, for example, at labor relations writ large, and to explain what it is that accounts for the decline in unionization, the key feature in this is not so much the way in which new workers join or do not join unions. That's been relatively constant at a low level. It's the attrition of jobs from established businesses, which is so much more dramatic in virtue of the fact that the wage structures that were negotiated are no longer, shall we say, sustainable in the face of all sorts of competition that comes from the other side. So the method that I would want to urge in order to improve the current situation with respect to employment has an exact opposite, a polarity difference, between that and the current administration. What I would try to do is to look at every system of regulation which is available, which does not meet the requirements of controlling force, fraud, or monopoly, and remove them systematically from the list in an effort to try and create a greater velocity of employment moving forward. Will this make a difference, you might ask? And the answer is on the empirical side that clearly it will. Because even though it's very difficult to do this if you only are looking at federal regulations, because those will have nationwide impact, it's very clear when you start looking at state kinds of variations in labor markets <coughs> that there are conspicuous differences. People tend to flee high tax jurisdictions and move to low tax jurisdictions. And if regulation is, in fact, a form of taxation, exactly the same consequences will happen there. So essentially, 19th century liberalization, in my view, is in fact the appropriate way in which to try to deal with this situation. And that would mean basically dismantling huge portions of the current regulatory apparatus. In administrative law, I teach the Fair Labor Standards Act. And you might think that this is a small and compact statute. But it just runs on forever and ever. And the kinds of exemptions and requirements that it imposes upon businesses are, to my mind, completely stifling. We should try to eliminate, not to enhance them. The current situation goes in exactly the opposite direction. And there is the illusion that through additional regulation, you can achieve distributional gains that will, in fact, not carry with them allocative losses. 
And let me sort of kind of give you the kinds of preambles that sort of lead to this situation. It is striking when you look at the Paycheck Fairness Act, the arguments that are made in effect for trying to introduce not an entirety, but certainly steps in that direction to a kind of general pay equity system in the United States, whereby wage differentials within and perhaps even across job categories have to be strictly justified under a test of business necessity where the burden of proof is upon the employer to explain why it is that the disparity should be respected rather than upon the employee to explain why it is that they have some weight associated with it. And the argument comes back that if to the extent that you could get parity, what you will now have in husband and wife, two wage earner families, higher wages than you had before. But this, of course, presupposes that the wages on the male side of the situation will remain constant in the face of regulation when there are two ways to achieve parity of wages. One is to lower the income on the one side, the other is to raise it, and there's nothing which tells you about the proportions that will take place on both hands. But if, in fact, we know that the movement towards equilibration could take place in both ways, there's absolutely no reason to believe that the sum of the employment wages gathered by husband and wife pairs under the new regime will exceed those under the old regime. And in fact, given the fact that there is now an additional regulatory apparatus that has to be complied with and to be put into place, we can be pretty confident that some of the wages will decline rather than increase in cost of what's going on. Well, why is it that you might want to do this on other grounds? And again, the assumptions that are made with respect to this statute are simply wrong relative to the huge empirical literature under this particular question. And the argument is that gender differences in wages have persist and that large portions of them can only be attributed to discrimination. One of the things that's so ironic about looking at any kind of congressional findings is whenever I read my administrative law cases, as some of you would well know, I'm always told that the expertise that Congress has with respect to these technical matters means that everybody ought to bend to their will when they decide to decree new legislation. But if you actually look at the findings that are appended to these various statutes, they have a level of intellectual primitivism associated with them, which is very difficult to understand and to believe. But essentially what they do is they manage to ignore literally thousands of articles which have tried to explain and deal with the problem of wage differentials between the two sexes, and in effect assimilate the argument that nothing much has changed since 1963 when the Equal Pay Act was passed, and that the situation is really very dire indeed. Everybody who runs the corrections on these things, of course, comes up with really quite different situations. And what do you have to correct for? Well, just about everything. Number of hours in the workplace is a very key variable. The kinds of training that you've had before you've gone in there. Your willingness to travel. Your attitude with respect to risk. Your willingness to take non-certain forms of competition. On and on. And when you start to correct for these things, you find out that the market analysis works relatively well. In the sense that if, in fact, there is a net gain to an employer from a female worker, which is equal to a greater that from a male, they will be hired until the wages go back into equilibrium. And so if you try and run the corrected figures, you don't get a 20 or 25 wage percent differential. The better evidence suggests that you're running something about 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 percent. And even then, the one thing that we're perfectly confident about is that if you organize a regression and can identify some features that might explain wage differences, it is methodologically inappropriate to assume that the residual term is solely attributable to discrimination. Jim Heckman, who's one of our foremost econometricians on this point, put the point to me in this way. And I think he actually published it. Maybe I read it. And what he said is, if you're somebody looking at a resume and an employee, you'll think of 30 or 40 things that you'd want to know before you make those differences and make those judgments. If you're trying to run a regression, you're lucky if you can get four or five variables in there. So if you're going to attribute the residual to discrimination only to discrimination, you're assuming that every other piece of information that comes in is utterly irrelevant. So in fact, if you try and organize this by subgroups, for example, the ability to find these kinds of persistent differences is much smaller than anyone would suppose. So what happens is by magnifying the proposed failure or the supposed failures of a market situation, what you've done is you've justified a government intervention which really, in my mind, makes no sense at all. And you must understand that this statute is not small potatoes in terms of the way in which it tightens the presumptions, reduces the factors that you can introduce in order to explain why these wage differentials exist, and so forth. And there will be many firms that will decide, rather than go into this particular thicket, 
it is better to contract out, perhaps overseas, to labor environments that are more congenial than the ones that we have here. When you start looking at the Lily Ledbetter statute with respect to various forms of sex discrimination, you come up with a somewhat different set of concerns, but one which is every bit as important as you have here. Uh, the question in many cases is, when you make a market decision in 1970, what influence does it have on the wages that somebody receives in the year 2000? And, and this is the way in which I would want to look at this question, which is to say, if you have a whole variety of corrective forces out there, the chances are that any mistake made 30 years ago will, in fact, be determinative of the particular kinds of employment decisions that are made today is a very exotic theory of proximate cause. It assumes that nobody receives offers from the outside, which prompt responses from employers to keep them. It assumes that there are no independent decisions that are made on retention, promotion, and transfer within the business in the interim period. And that somehow or other, this first decision is the one that kind of is built into the base, and everything else is simply put on top. I can assure you in my own experience in teaching in law schools one way or another, uh, that the salary history that I've seen, both as a dean and as my own personal case, starts with a kind of assumption that they're going to be cost-based adjustments over last year. But the moment these get out of equilibrium, all of a sudden there's a violent shift, hopefully in the upward direction, uh, to take into account the fact that the historical system is no longer working. And these forces of correction are perfectly routine. Gerhard Casper, when he was our dean, he made the following announcement to me, which I think captures the difficulty with this assumption. He said, Richard, he said with his German sag Freunde voice, he said, I am not doing my job as dean if the hierarchical order of faculty salaries is the same in the fifth year as it was in the first, meaning, in effect, if you just boosted people by percentage. That means I'm not being aware of the nature of the differential contributions that different faculty members have made. And so my job as a dean is to shake these things up. And some people may get 3% wages increases, but there are others who are going to get salary increases, which will be 10 or 20 in a given year for all sorts of good reasons. This is essentially the reality of labor markets. They respond to recent stimuli. And to the extent that you now try and prove one of these Ledbetter claims, this is what you will find that it's easy to make allegations that I was hired many years ago and my wages have lagged and that it all has to do with sex discrimination. But when you decide the statute of limitations question, you decide it on a demur. You don't look at the truth of the facts. You just simply assume that they're true. The moment you decide that the statute of limitations defense is not going to be available, what is going to happen? then it opens the record to an exhaustive examination of every personnel decision that took place within the interim. And how are you going to be able to decide which of these are true and which of them are false, which way you're going to run the burdens of proof, how you're going to assimilate the evidence is going to be a kind of a nightmarish deliberation. When will these cases be brought? And this is a key thing that you must always remember. No person wants to sue a current employer for any form of discrimination because it's poison with respect to your ability to continue in the workplace. And in fact, it is generally understood that if you bring cases like this, the knowledge will precede you, and it will be very difficult to get a job with another employee. So what happens is the Ledbetter case is not an exception to this rule. You wait until you retire, and then, since you no longer are subject to these kinds of market discipline and forces, you bring these sorts of suits. What will this do with respect to firms? Well, one of the things it will do is, since everybody has people coming in and out of jobs at a very high rate, you'll have to start to re-examine your entire salary portfolios for everybody with an idea of how it is that you immunize yourself from some kind of prospective liability, only to be told that if you do that, that's proof positive that you engage in some kind of bad practices earlier on in the game, and so that you'll be in trouble. This means, in effect, that searching the personnel records is going to routinely take place and what was characteristic about this particular statute was there was no willingness to compromise on what I think to be a most dubious project to begin with by saying, look, you could go back 10 years in the record, but you can't go back 20 years in the record because the reliability and significance of the ancient materials is simply too well. This is a characteristic which is mark, uh, all too common in the modern regulatory state. You identify a small imperfection. You think you have a benefit that comes from having greater scrutiny. And then what you do is you say, I'm just going to keep pushing that. And to the point where the benefits become very marginal, even by your own accounting, and the costs become very high, you find no way to cut back and try to split the difference.
So it is characteristic of this particular statute that any employment decision which is said to trigger discrimination in effect is subject to another action each period. So that if you build it into the base in 1970 and you pay wages in 71 through 2000, every single year you've engaged in a fresh act of discrimination, or at least presumptively so for the purposes of the statute of limitations. The consequences of this will be essentially to try to figure out how you trim your labor forces in order to minimize the exposure to the future liability. The particular pattern doesn't matter whether it's this or the Fairness Act. In both cases, the unambiguous prediction is that efforts to try and improve the market by these devices will not work. Now, these are the more progressive and enlightened statutes. By far the most dangerous statute that you have to deal with under these circumstances is the Employee Free Choice Act. I should tell you I've spent a lot of time working on that situation because I've just written a volume on this for a whole variety of employer groups who are frankly petrified about the passage of this particular statute and the way they think it will affect their particular business. And I think that they are actually in some sense underestimate the nature of the dangers that are associated with the statutes in question. Let me see if I could put the thing into perspective for you before I talk about some of the particulars of the act. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is to understand the condition of labor unions in the modern marketplace. Uh, the watershed events in this particular area all took place in the 1930s, and the key statute amongst them was the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, or the Wagner Act, which essentially guaranteed the right to collective bargaining. And the key feature with respect to this system as it was originally conceived was A, that there was no way in which the state would actually force an employer to yield to particular terms in their negotiation with the union, but B, there was no way that they could resist bargaining once a majority of workers in a given bargaining unit had assented to the operation of a union. Once you do this, of course, how do you choose a union? The answer is under the NLRB situation, the basic method is a secret ballot after a campaign. Nobody alleges that the ballots themselves have been inc improperly counted or operated. In fact, all the reports suggest that the National Labor Relations Board has done an exceedingly good job in the way in which they've execute, actually executed the elections. These are smaller elections than you're talking about in political bodies, and you really can watch and guard them very, very well. The battle in this area has all been over the campaign tactics used on both sides in order to achieve victory under these circumstances. The labor argument is that management speech designed to discourage workers has in fact put a thrall on the way in which unions can operate. And the employer response is the tough guy tactics that unions use in efforts to get publicity campaigns against employers have exactly the same effect on the opposite side. The only reason you get these stream tactics on both sides, of course, is frankly they don't like each other very much at the stage of an organization campaign. I have never met an employer who thinks that on average its position will be better off with the imposition of a union than without it. If they did think so, they could organize one voluntarily in order to achieve the gains without the pain. If they tried to do so, however, under current law, they would be engaged in forming an uncompany union, which is an unfair labor practice under Section um, 8A2 of the Act. So you have a lot of tensions going on in this situation, real pressures on both sides. In the early days, the statutes made a huge difference in the level of unionized workforces. And it went up by 15 or 20 points. I don't remember the exact number. So that about 1955, when the AFL and CIO merged, uh, in the private sector, unions were about 35% of the workforce. Uh, in the next 50 years or so, that number has shrunk to about 8%. That it has gone down by over 80%, essentially while the rise of public unionized worker has offset the difficulty. And the question has come, what is the source of the declines of the workers? The union story is essentially, it is massive resistance by employers, which has led to the transformation, and that the statute itself has to be modified in order to deal with this. The employer story is more complicated, but I think in the end it's more persuasive, and it says, whatever you think about these tactics that are available under the National Labor Relations Act, they cannot explain the differential. These tactics have been allowed one way or another since 1959 without change. All of the changes have come essentially in a constant legal environment. You cannot find stasis as the sort of change explanation. And indeed, if you start looking to other systems which have very different rules for labor relationships, 
you see essentially the same rate of decline in virtually all the Western industrialized countries. So that what you have to do is to find sources outside the actual mechanism of labor to explain the decline in question. What might these be? Well, there are a number of them, and they're all, I think, extremely important. One of them is globalization. There is no question if you reduce the tariff barriers from goods moving in and out of countries, the ability of any firm to get a monopoly profit for itself is going to be eroded. And if the firm could not get a monopoly profit, the labor unions that organize it could not extract the monopoly profit from them. So that what happens is, as the product market becomes more competitive, the gains from unionization to workers start to diminish. The cost, of course, do not go down commensurately with it. But if the cost remain constant and the gains go down, you just have a perfectly rational explanation that many people who once thought that unions were appropriate will no longer think so. Second explanation has to do with the nature of the workplace. And it points in exactly the same direction. It is to get collective bargaining to work, essentially what you have to do is to have an industrial structure that minimizes the internal conflicts amongst the various workers in a given bargaining unit. If they, all of them have the same essential interests in the perfect case, it means quite simply that the only way you could help one worker is to help another worker because they all have parallel positions. And therefore, bargaining is something that the workers would want to do because they have more confidence that the union will become their faithful agent. The moment you introduce heterogeneity into the workforce, either by specialization or by rapid turnover, that identity of interest amongst the workers no longer exists. At this particular point, the conflict of interest, which has always been a problem with respect to collective bargaining, becomes much more acute. And as people have left confidence that a union can actually do something which benefits them all equally, those who are skeptical will start to bail out from union representation. And remember, a very small change in electoral composition in one of these bargaining units can lead to decertification. And the third explanation is more ominous, but it's probably the most powerful at all, is when you look at these first two things and you want to account for the decline in unionization, essentially it turns out that they cannot remain competitive. What you're seeing now in the automobile industry is really just the last stage in a very complex process. You lose 500,000 union members since 2000 because of attrition. You have the same thing with the rubber workers, the steel workers. All the old line industrial unions have very much smaller portions of what they did before. And they cannot compete on wages and more importantly on flexibility with the new non-union firms that have come up. So if you want to check the numbers and you look at the rise of the non-union shops like you know, well, Toyota and Nissan with respect to automobiles or Target and Walmart, you see huge growth rates. If you look at their traditional union competitors, you tend to see stagnant workforces because they cannot expand under these circumstances. So the question then is, what do we do about this situation? And here, the analysis that you have with respect to the disease will lead you very strong with respect to the cure. My own view about the situation, and I've made this clear, I guess, since 1983, is that I think the common law regime is perfectly appropriate. And one of the ironies of all of this is I did so at the Yale Law School in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the New Deal. I was the lone conservative allowed to speak at this particular event. And that one of the people in the audience is a woman named Cynthia Estlin, my colleague at NYU when I'm there as opposed to here, who is one of the leaders of the Obama transition team. So I guess my positions have certainly been well known to her and to a lot of other people for a very long period of time. But in the current situation, you have to treat the National Labor Relations Act as a bedrock institution. You cannot treat it as a contestable item subject to be revisioned. And the only question is whether you tighten the noose rather than loosen it. And if you believe, as the unions have argued, that the source of decline is attributable solely to the way in which organizational campaigns take place, that dictates the remedies you want. The remedies come in three parts. One of them I don't like, but I think is on the grand scheme of things, relatively, obnox relatively <coughs> innocuous. The other two, I think, are much more dangerous. The innocuous portion is that section of the new area which says that we're going to beef up the sanctions for unfair labor practices against employers if they commit various breaches of their duties in the course of an organization campaign. So if you start to speak, the current law says that an employer is allowed to predict that he'll be forced to shut down if it turns out that a union is organized. But he can't say, you guys try and organize me. I'm going to just shut down because I don't want to have anything to do with you. 
So the grammarians essentially become the dominant persons in advising employer campaigns. You have to stay on the right side of that line. How clear is the line? Well, everybody knows if you can make an express threat, you can make an implied threat. And when is this prediction an implied threat is the kind of question that casuists can argue about. Workers, of course, know that unions are faced with no similar constraint. In their campaigns, they can make any promises they want. It's only the employers that are subject to this exception. So I mean, the whole thing is, in that, is asymmetrical. I think this is uncalled for, because I think that the net effect of it will reduce the effectiveness of employer speech. And if, as I happen to think, that they actually have a very strong case to telling workers that by the time you take into account uncertainty and dues, you're worse off at this union than you are without it, I want that message to be able to get out there. The unions clearly do not. Well, that one you could live with, perhaps. The other two provisions are much more radical. The first of them goes to the secret ballot. And it says that this is no longer a precondition. It's an option. If the union wants to have a secret ballot election, it's entitled to do so. If not, what it could then do is rely on something known as the card check in order to secure the majority that will compel movement into the collective bargaining system. A card check is a very controversial institution. Right now, the current law provides that if a union can get the cards from 30% of its workers, it can force an election. What, what unions do is they think about this and they realize if they only get 30%, they'll probably lose some of those to the secret ballot. So typically, they won't call for elections until they have 55 or 60% of the people on card check. Even then, they still lose about half the elections that take place, and they win half. The total number of workers involved may be a couple hundred thousand a year, which is much smaller than the attrition rate that I've referred to before. So the card check at this particular point has the feature that many workers are willing to sign cards because they know that the secret ballot means that they can basically express an anti-union preference without having to alienate a union leader. At this particular point, however, the card check is a much higher thing. Once you get the card signed, then in effect, you get 50% of them, there's a union. Now, when do you sign the cards? Well, the rule currently is, or the proposal is, that if you get a card any time in the last six months, the union can hold that card and then get cards from somebody else so that if the first worker changes his mind, he's no longer able to get the card back. Uh, essentially, these cards are not authorized, they're not notarized, they're not observed, they're collected and held by the union, and at just the right time, for just the right unit, they put them in there. The danger that many people believe is that there's Campaigns could be run in secret. You cannot get a debate over these things. There's the real danger of intimidation because you could collect the cards at any place. There's no independent public oversight of any portion of the particular process. The only way that you can challenge a card is essentially to prove that it's a forgery, which, by the way, is a real complicated issue in many of these cases when you start to deal with workers whose English is not their first language and so forth. Do not underestimate the difficulties for the administration of this particular kind of provision. And so on the public side, uh, I think the sentiment is strongly anti-card check. Um, the polls usually show fairly convincing majorities in the neighborhood of 70% or more of people who think that the secret ballot is really something that you have to worry about because coercion by workers from, on workers by unions is a serious issue, even if coercion by employers is a serious issue. The secret ballot, to some extent, is able to deal with both of these things. What makes the current statute truly dangerous, in my view, is the consequence of a card check. The current law provides that once a union is recognized, the two sides go toe to toe. Bargaining in good faith is an extremely difficult situation because no longer do you have competitive forces that reduce the difference between the bid and the ask price. What you do is essentially you have this artificially monopoly created situation where the union is the exclusive representative of all the workers in the union and the employer is duty bound to deal with them. There is no unique bargain that comes out of that institutional structure. The wages can go from here to there and in addition to the wages, the typical collective bargaining agreement is based upon the following paradigm, one of strong mutual distrust. And so the moment you have two sides that have been fighting over each other, the contracts get longer, they get much more detailed, and they give you relatively little room for subsequent discretion because in an, an environment where the trust is not high on both sides, discretion turns out to be the enemy. If you look at a, collect, a typical collective bargaining agreement today, in a complicated business, it can be that thick. There can be detailed provisions on sick pay, detailed provisions having to do with plan closing, 
detailed provisions on grievances, detailed provisions on dealing with sick time and so forth. And every single one of those has to be spelled out because you have a large number of workers, you're worried about parity of treatments amongst them, everybody's afraid that the other side is going to try to pull a fast one. And these agreements can often take a year or two or longer to negotiate. And then they give rise to this constant situation where low-level grievances give rise to informal adjudication within the framework of the labor situation. What happens is that there are many cases in which these labor contracts don't take. That is, the difficulties of bargaining on the both sides are so great that the two sides do not reach an agreement. In some cases, the unions are able to get an order which requires either collective bargaining or sometimes rarely, but almost never, uh, some kind of a contract if they can show that there's a consistent pattern and practice of unfair labor practices in negotiation by the employer. And what is an unfair labor practice is a complicated issue here because the basic rules say that employers are never allowed to engage in tactics that are too effective. So if, for example, once a union comes along, you are not allowed to give your workers a unilateral wage increase because that simply takes the steam out of the union drive. And so this is now regarded as coercive behavior within the peculiar framework of the labor statutes. It's the correct decision given the labor laws because otherwise the employers will have too much of the upper hand. So you have all of these very delicate situations, but what happens, and this is an important difference, after 50 years of experience on this, unions cannot basically trap employers to making dumb mistakes and creating unfair labor practices. The representation on the other side is good enough so that it's my A team against your A team, and generally speaking under those circumstances, the unions do not come out ideally well. How do we know this? Because the conflict of interest that I referred to before become extremely important in the modern context because what you see now are many two-tier negotiations in both public and private unions. You know you have a dwindling monopoly. You know that your current workers will not take wage cuts. So what you do is you announce that all future employees will be on a wage scale, which is 50 to 60 percent that of the current employees, in order essentially to create cross-subsidies amongst union members. So you get all of these dynamics that are going on. What is the union solution to this problem? It's to create a system of compulsory interest arbitration. And it's important that you understand what both of these words mean. Compulsory means that there is no option on the part of the employer to walk away from any deal that he doesn't like. And if the union and the employer cannot agree, then in effect an arbitrator will decide. What does this mean when we call it interest arbitration? Well, in the labor business there are two forms of arbitration. One is called grievance arbitration, and the other is called interest. A grievance arbitration, which everybody believes in, in the union framework, is if there is a contract and there's a worker who claims that he's been aggrieved by breach of that contract by the employer, you can have an arbitral discussion to figure out how it is that you resolve that particular complaint. The worker could win, the worker could lose. Unfortunately, the worker cannot decide to unilaterally press this grievance the union has control over that under a decision called Vaca and Sipes. And this was on my final exam at law school in 1967. I didn't do very well because I had the result come out the opposite way. And my first publication was trying to explain why it was that Vaca and Sipes was a wrong kind of decision. I mean, so my interest in labor law goes back a very long time, to put it mildly. Um, I could not understand when I heard Harry Wellington teach this course how any person of such intelligence could believe in a system that was so complicated and ornate. And my mind on that issue has not changed, although the arguments about it have changed in the subsequent 40 odd years since I first took this class. When I saw Harry at dinner another night, I sort of shook my finger at him for the way in which he taught the labor law. Now this, he's now 80 odd years old, but I was still after him. I mean, you know, <laughs> no rest for the weary, right? But anyhow, so you force the negotiations. And how does this work? Well, the labor statute provides, and this is really astonishing, it says that you have 10 days to organize a collective bargaining team as an employer. So think of yourself as a four, small business. You've got 18 employees, 10 of them assigned cards. And now, 10 days after you do it, you have to hire a lawyer, figure out what all the negotiation rules are. And then you have 90 days to negotiate without, 30 days with a mediator, and then at the 130th day, it goes to an arbitrator panel to be appointed by well, we don't know who. The statute itself says it shall be a panel, so you know there's at least one, more than one. And it's under rules and regulations to be determined after the passage of the statute. But the rules won't come out when the arbitrations begin because the statute has an immediate effective date. So you're going to basically go to an arbitral panel 
and they're going to have to replicate out of whole cloth the same complicated bargaining agreements that are currently reached or not reached in the collective situation. You have a firm, and a large firm, it may have 100 unions in different branches coming up simultaneously, and we don't even know whether the arbitrators have to coordinate or not coordinate their demands in question. My view about it is that this is a straight form of expropriation, and even under modern law would be regarded as unconstitutional. But I've been wrong on these kinds of issues before, and who knows? Nobody can tell you for certain about how it is that the constitutional issues will play out. But what you can say, in effect, is that the one set of provisions that you need to have in order to make these things go is not in the bill. That's the bankruptcy stuff. You really have to know how that's going to play out because this statute is immensely expensive and highly coercive. The first contract lasts for only two years, after which we could expect all hell to break loose again. So that's the current program. I cannot understand how it is that this will actually help matters. It will certainly result in some workers getting a short-term boon. It will result in a systematic contraction in the rest of the economy. And it all rests upon the assumption of the original 1935 Labor Act, which was, in effect, if, in fact, we get monopoly unions and combine them with government monopoly cartels, the two monopolists can find a way to raise their levels, and so you'll get a social improvement out of a private game. And essentially, when you're against these statutes, you really believe that competitive labor markets outperform government monopolistic markets. And anyone, I think, who's looked closely at the structure over the last 70 years will come to that conclusion. I will, however, stop at this point because I think it's appropriate for any of you, all of you, to disagree with this, and I think it's probably time that I take questions. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. All right, well, there's got to be somebody who has something to ask. Well, I mean, this is a University of Chicago crowd, right? Yes? Given that you said that the pressures of globalization have started to decrease the amount of unionized workers, why should we care whether this uh, new law is passed? Unions are disappearing. Um, the answer is you should care because globalization, in effect, has the greater impact with respect to the kinds of industries that I've talked about, namely those where importation of finished products can actually alter the workplace. The key target of this is essentially told by who the backer is. It's the SEIU is the strongest backer of this. And essentially, you just have to understand that you know, they basically have pushed Obama very hard on this issue. Service workers in localized establishments do not suffer the same level of international competition as the first order. So the key point is, if you can organize your hotels, your, your restaurants, your retailers, and so forth, that will change the way in which the particular operations go. All right, the second question is that is a very complicated bargaining game whenever you introduce unions. One of the things that's so common, if you start looking back at the literature, for example, about the UAW, is they will always give you the following speech. We can't make money unless GM makes money. So therefore, we have no interest in driving it into the ground. And you know what? That's absolutely right. But there's a conflict of interest there on the question of who gets what. Every time a union can negotiate an additional dollar to its members, it gets the full dollars. If it turns out it increases the risk of bankruptcy, a large portion of that risk falls on the shareholders, the management team, the non-union workers, and so forth, and the suppliers. Well, they don't have the right set of incentives to get this thing correctly because they internalize all the gains from monopolization, but they can externalize a very large portion of the cost. This means that systematically they're going to go a bit more aggressively than the ideal party would do if he had the full cost and the full benefit structure. And you know what happens is they all miscalculate. And it got even worse. Why is this? Because inside a union structure, particularly if it's a long-standing union, seniority matters for governance, seniority matters for distribution. The guys who are there and in the pension fund, they want to make sure GM supplies you know, to the year 2000 when they die. They're not worried about it going to 2030, which is the key interest of the younger guys. So to put it in the old language, everybody who criticizes markets rightly points to the fact that there are all sorts of internal conflicts of interest within the firm. The whole problem of agency costs that was identified by Jensen and Meckling 30 odd years ago is real in businesses. But of course, shareholder discipline will help keep you on that line, take over bids, exchange of prices, whatever it is. The same issues exist in unions. 
It's not as though when you start working in a mandated structure like this that the agency cost problems disappear. In fact, they become much more aggravated because you have none of the takeover or external control methods. You have none of the profit mechanisms that work on this stuff. So you really have to worry because you don't want to have somebody miscalculate and take everybody down. Does this mean that it's going to work all the cases? No, I do think that there'll be some situations under the EFCA where they will unionize and you'll have good union relationships. There is no theorem which explains how successful a union's going to be. You have airlines like Southwest, which are strongly unionized, and they've always figured out how to divide the gains without blowing up the ship. You look at Northwest Airlines, they have a strike a year. You look at this law school and this university, we don't seem to have many real union negotiation problems. Go look at the Yale University, right? And it turns out they're constantly faced with major strikes and dislocation. And what you have to do is to understand that in a structure which is competitive, Essentially, the attitudes of a very few individuals don't matter that much because they get wiped out if they're obdurate and some other people take over. But in a monopoly-type structure, the people who are your leaders determine the entire shape of the organization. And so if you can, in fact, have uh, just the simplest paradigm, tough management, tough union, weak management, weak union, and run the four pairs together, you'll see that, well, you get weak, weak, it's wonderful. You get strong, tough, God knows which way it's going to work. You get tough, tough, it's going to blow up. Right? So, I mean, that's the problem that you get. Uh, you concentrate power, it means that you increase the variability, and that's extremely important if you're worried about the stability over time of a particular industry. So the international stuff is a force, right? But it's not the entire story. All these other things matter as well. That's why labor relationship is so complicated to run, even though it turns out, I think, identifying the legal regime that works best the open market one is a relatively straightforward affair. There must be another question. Yes, in the back, Mr. Kellogg. Yeah, with the off the Lebanon Act, you mentioned that the only people with incentives to bring suit are people looking to retire. So I'm, I, I would think that doesn't that mean that the employer is going to win with discrimination a lot and therefore the increased costs? No, no, no. Because what happens is you have to remember what I'm talking about is individual grievances, but the whole structure is extremely complicated. Right now, any short-term public decision that you make, like suppose you were to come out and say, I'm paying my women workers, 110% of you are men workers on wages and so forth. Uh, that's an instant public violation. You have the direct enforcement by the EEOC. It certainly happens that you have 180 days. And in some of these cases, if you're talking about a discriminatory dismissal where the boss comes up to you and says, I just don't want women working in my retail outfit, you don't need the statute of limitations. What you'd have to ask is whether or not you think the current structure has demonstrated any systematic increase in the level of discrimination relative to previous times. And, you know, I've been around this labor market long enough, and I have to tell you, uh, it's a completely different game. And let me mention one feature which I think is the most important. When I started teaching, essentially in 1968, we had a male faculty. We actually had a woman dean, but she was an interim, right? Um, and then we were trying to figure out what to do, and the whole question is women were starting to come into the profession as students. And you really had this funny sense, us against them. Now, most of us actually at that age were not of the same opinion as people 20 and 30 years older than us, and so it wasn't, I thought, a big deal. But today, that's not the way it works. You can't find a hiring committee in the United States in a law school or a personnel committee in an age major firm which doesn't have a very large percentage of women and members of minority groups on it one way or another. You change the composition of the workforce. That is by far the most powerful protection that's going on. I can still remember going to a European office, I think it was in London, of Goldman Sachs, and I meet one of the guys there, and I look at all the names on the doors, and I can't figure out the nationality of the people or the sex from the first names. I said to him, this is a real place in which you've got to have people from everywhere. And this is what I was told. I said, unless you're comfortable with working everybody, you have no future at Goldman Sachs. Um, because that's the only way we can hire. I can still remember one of the former trustees of the University of Chicago, um, who was a head of a major corporation. And he pulled me aside to talk about labor relationships, uh, treating me like the naive that I was. And he says, I'm not interested in firm suicide. I look at the job market, and I see that only 35% of the pool are white males. I cannot run a multinational corporation by all ignoring two-thirds the workforce. And I mean, those forces really matter under these circumstances. So to think that the statute, which has got lots of enforcement mechanisms in place, is the key feature is wrong. What really matters in these things are the voluntary actions taken in firms. And let me give you the other point. You know, there's always the question of do you or do you not believe in affirmative action? And you know, 
My attitude about it is, again, atypical, which is I actually think it's a private decision for individual firms to make. And what happens is if they want to make it in favor of affirmative action, that's fine. If they want to go the other way, it's fine by me. But if you actually put it to that situation, there are very few firms that will not engage in some programs of that sort. But the big difference by doing it privately as opposed to publicly is the one I hinted at before. They know when to quit. They can figure out when it's going to work, when it's not going to work. They can make a corrections and adjustments. If you do it through government properties, projects, every time you want to make a change, you've got to get the entire board to go along. And it's going to be much more ideological and much less pragmatic in the way in which it operates. So if you know the full type of situations, I don't think you would want to say that you have to have this statute. You also have to understand that it's a powerful threat um, in many cases where there is no discrimination, because one of the things that you know is all the litigation advances go to the workers because all the paperwork is in the hands of the employer. And that asymmetry in discovery is a huge advantage with respect to the settlement of these cases. Okay, other questions? Mr. Heron? Um, how do you think the passage of this legislation will affect state laws on unions, particularly the cleavage between pro-union and pro-right-to-work slips. Oh, oh that, that's a very interesting question. Um, currently, um, for may, many of you may or may not know, there are things in place known as the right-to-work laws. And these essentially say that uh, if you're in a right-to-work state, you may have union representation, but you can't be required to work as a member of the union. In some cases, can't be required to pay dues. They, there are all sorts of variations. Those states, a crude empirical <coughs> study would suggest, have done much better in job creation than the strong pro-union states. If you want to look at the list of stagnant states in total employment, not only union employment, start with Illinois, New York, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and so forth. And you have a very good list of states which had high union concentration. So the migration has been going down. The prediction you would make is that this option would become more valuable if the unions are less welcome, so that the exodus from the northern states to the sort of western and southern states would start to increase. This, of course, will create another political dynamic, which is I think that there will be an effort to repeal that provision of the Taft-Hartley bill, which allows states to opt out of the national system, at which point you would do it the other way around. Remember, there's a real problem that you have here about this parity stuff um, with trade and everything else. You could do one or two things. You could create parity by creating a set of institutions that has Ohio look like Texas in terms of growth, or you can create parity by having Texas look like Ohio. Uh, the current situation is very much in the latter mode. I'll bring you down, because then if I bring you down, you don't have a competitive advantage, so I'll bring myself up. What happens is their decline will be greater than your advance, and that what you'll start to see is more outsourcing, as people will realize that this is just an extremely dangerous way in which to try to work in an environment. And what you have to understand is when a business comes along, it's not going to just look at this law. It's going to look at the current Democratic Congress and the Obama administration and say, if they're willing to do this in the first six months that they're in office, what are they going to have in store for us down the road? There are so many issues that we can really tighten the screws on. Why do I want to put myself into a situation where, in effect, I have no legal protections through the courts and huge political exposures? I think I'll go to Canada, or I think I'll go to Hong Kong, or Australia, or any other place on the face of the globe. So the global competition will increase at which point there'll be pressure for higher tariffs against importation. And the thing that I fear most is the thing that I referred to in the debate that I had with Cass Sunstein, now of the administration, back in March of last year, which is that the new program will have the three elements which made the New Deal such a walking, talking, screaming disaster. Uh, one of them is very high tariff barriers, which prevent international trade, which was Smoot-Hawley. This was, in fact, a Hoover confection, but it was absorbed and kept on by Roosevelt. Then you have very strong labor stuff. This started under Hoover with Davis Bacon and with Norris LaGuardia. They're both Hoover statutes. And then was kept up with the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act, both of which are Roosevelt creations. And then you'll have high marginal tax brackets in order to create a system of redistribution. It took us 40 years to get out of that particular box. And what will happen is nobody will be so overt to say that we want to go back to that policy. But free trade will be fair trade as well as free. And then it turns out that the labor stuff will increase. And then, in fact, we'll have to have higher differential taxes through targeted rebates and so forth so that you'll get some version of that program. It did not work the first time. It will not work the second time. I wish that I could. Never mind. I'm not the most politically powerful <laughs> member who's ever taught from the University of Chicago Law School faculty. I think we could take it. OK, question, yeah? You talked about the, the 
um, wage differential and how when you correct it, it goes down to 5%? Or oh, less. Uh, can you talk, can you, do you think that the adaptive preferences in those controls should matter, like, you know, education or, or, or switching out? And, and how do you explain the gender difference at the top of the organizational chart? Oh, well, look, first of all, my view about adaptive preferences is that everybody adapts their preferences in every particular way. And that if you're trying to explain individual decisions, they may help you as to why Smith chooses this job or Jones that. But in explaining aggregate phenomena, it doesn't work. The theory of adaptive preferences, which says, in effect, that you ought to continue along the lines that were familiar to you or which had been imposed upon you with respect to sort of gender roles or race roles and so forth, cannot explain why it is that 50% of the members of a medical school class today or a law school today class are female. Somehow or other, they never got the message. And in fact, that's true everywhere. The thing that is most conspicuous about the labor type situation is, in fact, the huge amounts of statistical upheaval that has taken place over these periods of time in both sectoral employment and, in fact, in the kinds of mixes that take place. So I don't see any evidence whatsoever about adaptive preferences as creating a constraint on movement. I, I, I don't even think that that case is close. And all of the arguments in favor of it are not done on sort of mass empirical studies of major labor market movement. They're kind of psychological introspection of the sort that Jan Elster does, which frankly doesn't move me in the slightest. The question is differentials at the top. There are two stories. One is that's changing. I mean, in the last generation, in part, you'd expect a lag on this relative to anything else because it takes 25 or 30 years in an organization or in organizations to become chief executive officers. And the number of women who are at the very, very top one position may not be as large as it is men. But you start going into executive committees, boards of directors, management of divisions, and so forth, and the numbers have started to shift and shift conspicuously. In fact, I mean, in many of these firms, there are very strong incentives to try to get women into high places because it means that you could meet all market sectors instead of only some. The question is, why does the differential start to exist? Well, the answer is one that has been highly debated, but you have to take into account not only the preferences of the firms, but you have to take into account the preferences of the workers. And this is a very complicated subject, because it turns out that there are many women who would rather hedge their bets, raise a family, take a few years out of the labor force, then come back in after the children are of a certain age. And those women, in effect, have taken themselves out of the race for the very top because there's no way that you can make up the ground that's lost in the workplace. So if you actually look at single women who don't have these distractions and their income profile, they're actually earning slightly more money than married men. Um, so I mean, you know, th there's a clear kind of situation. And then the higher you start to go inside an organization, uh, the less you care about aggregate characteristics and the more you care about the very distinctive features of the one person. There is nothing which says that the distribution on the variance has to be the same between the two sexes. And in fact, if you look at sort of math aptitude and so forth, and you sort of figure out, well, what's the top level? The ratio is about 9 to 1 you know, on the very, very difficult test, men to women. On the other hand, if you're trying to take most jobs, you don't need to have those kinds of skills. You need to have skills which are much more manageable, which large women have. So what you're finding, in effect, is a replication of that pattern of distribution that takes place. Uh, essentially, you find that the, the very high risk positions, there's a larger number of men than women, but in management positions generally, there's many women as men. And the thing to remember about this is you cannot figure out labor source success about, you know, labor source, labor supply success by only looking at the people in the workplace. What is so striking about the American workplace is at the bottom, it's heavily populated by men. I mean, in terms of dropouts, criminal situation, drugs, death, all sorts of other things that start to take place, we guys actually have it hand and fist over women. And you want to just take one number which shows that the difference at the bottom is at the present level of education in secondary in, in, in universities, it's basically a differential of 57 to 58 women in universities to 42 or 43 percent men, which in fact is a, is a number which ought to lead you to some worry in the opposite kind of direction. Uh, because it suggests that you're not going to have parity and that this can affect all sorts of other markets. So I think, in effect, that there are all such things that you might want to work about and to worry about. But I would then put the last point. Is suppose you were right about this adaptive preference stuff, which I don't put much stock in. There's nothing about the labor statutes which solve that issue. What on earth can you do through a Fair Pay Act or through a statute of limitations or through a mandatory union statute to get more female CEOs? I just don't understand the connection at all. And until somebody can tell me one, I don't think you want to hold that up. I mean, the question of what's going to happen to mid-level workers, well, the gaps have gotten much narrower, and those are the things for which these statutes are done. 
the entire question of how you deal with the 0.01% elite is a very different question, better reserved for corporate discussions on how you put boards together and so forth. OK, time for, I guess, one more question, if there's somebody who has it. Oh, yes. Uh, do, you ever, do you ever feel guilty for thinking that these tired political questions that used to divide us still matter? <laughs> boy, oh boy, feel guilty. Um, let me put it to you the other way around. Um, these vital political questions that divide us will determine the success or failure of this nation going forward. And my long-term fear is that we have now figured out ways in which to expand the scope of regulation as opposed to private activity in every single sector that you would care to manage, whether you're talking about the FDA or the labor statutes or the Endangered Species Act or the air pollution statutes, on and on. And in the end, what I fear is that the following massive political disequilibrium will take place. Everybody who looks at his own area of regulation says, hey, this makes sense on distributional grounds, and we're a plenty productive society, so don't worry about it. Well, what happens is you keep lowering that boat in the water. And sooner or later, the gunnels are going to be below the water line, and that may be where we're heading today. That is, I think, in effect, it's the cumulative and uncoordinated effects of multiple schemes of regulation, each of which is perverse in its own way, which have combined to create what is now a real danger of total stagnation. <coughs> this situation will, on balance, get worse. Um, and the reason it will get worse is that we have people in Washington in very high places who think that they're the solution instead of thinking they're the problem. If you have a large vector and you're running it in the wrong direction, you're going to come up with very bad results. So far from this being a tired question that doesn't matter, this is a huge train roaring down the wrong track. And <laughs> until you manage to get this thing off the rails and to slow it down, you're going to be in for worse times. And on unfortunately, the biggest problem is that our engineer-in-chief does not understand the direction in which he has moved. Thank you.